need help, they call the police. When the police need help, they call the emergency service unit. Police emergency service workers are being credited with saving a woman's life. New York cops in full combat regalia. CNN, there are reports of an explosion pop. Got me. Yeah, it gave me some goosebumps. That's yeah. not my opening. It's yeah, so good. Up after seeing that uh, video. Hi, Mike. Everybody, yeah. else? Frank, uh, retired detective from Mercy Service, Truck Three, and also from Floyd Bennett Field. In there you go. There you go. And on that note, we welcome you to Volume Nine of the E Men Inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit. That little forty-second clip that you saw after my theme. That is from a YouTube channel called ESS7. I don't know the exact guy's name. That's the name of his channel, though, so credit to him if he watches this. Thank you, sir. That is an outstanding job that you did uh, with, with that opening there. Not for me, but for an, a separate video he did that I'll try to put in the link, uh, a link to, rather, in the description of this video a little bit later on. But as you heard, that's David Brink. David Brink was a three-truck guy. He did 27 years in total, close to 27 years in total, with the New York City Police Department, and he was a stalwart of Truck 3. He was there for a decade, worked out of Floyd Bennett, like you heard him say. And he is here tonight for volume nine of the e -Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. Hey, Dave, welcome. How are you? Hi, very good, Mike. Thanks for having me once again. Uh, no problem. Uh, thanks to you, for, to, to you for being here this evening. So first question, always an easy one. Where did you grow up, Dave? Okay, I grew up uh, on Long Island in Massapequa primarily. Uh, I was a, uh, a, a child to a single mom. My mom and dad got divorced when I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's kind of my uh, scenario, too. My mom raised me alone for many, many years. So we come from the same uh, from boat in that scenario. But, hey, you know, it, it, we still came out OK. So that's a credit to, to our oh, mothers. Yeah. For sure. Thank God for strong moms. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, no kidding. No yeah. kidding. So, yeah, no, absolutely. So was going on to civil service something that was always the first choice for you? Did you take just the PD test or did you do what a lot of guys did and take FD and PD? Well, you know, um, the civil service wasn't the first option for me. Back in the uh, early 80s, when I came on, a lot of my friends were going into the financial field. Mm. Uh, finance was doing very, very well back then. Uh, unfortunately, college wasn't in the books for me. I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, my grades weren't uh, that great. And my mom said, hey, you need to get some health care for yourself. So I started taking some exams. I was a volunteer fireman out here in Long Island in Massapequa at the time, and I was an EMT. And I took the test with a bunch of friends out here. Um, PD wasn't my first choice. I would be a fireman because I was already a volunteer. So I kind of knew what that was about. Uh, I took the NYPD exam in 1984. And uh, I fortunately, I did pretty good. I wrote a 95.5 and I was in band two uh, for the 4061 exam for all you old timers. Out there. And uh, I took it in Canarsie High School. And I waited for about a year or so before I started getting investigated for the job. You know, it's so interesting because this is basically the reverse of what some other guys have told me when I spoke to my FD friends previously for the Best of the Bravest miniseries on this show. It's like, yeah, you know, I thought about, you know, I think I wanted to be a cop, but I was a volley out on the island. And then I ended up taking a test and thinking I was going to be a cop. And then the FD called me first and the rest is history. But that's it's literally the reverse. And Massapequa was a hotbed for it, because think about it. Among the many notable names that was a volley, I think, out on Massapequa, or at least lived in Massapequa, Chief of Department Peter Gancy of the FDNY. Yeah, there's a lot of volunteer fire. I'm sorry, uh, paid city firemen and paid city cops that live out in Massapequa. Uh, yeah. So the hotbed. Uh, so we all knew each other out there growing up. Yeah, it's either Massapequa or it's Deer Park. Uh, yeah, exactly. The Vigiano family came from Deer Park. You know the yeah. famous Vigianos. Uh, two FD and one, of course, uh, Joey Vig on emergency service with me, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a seven five guy. Um, so yeah, it's another hotbed. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. Well Absolutely. We'll continue in a moment with Dave Brink for Volume 9 of the E-Men inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit. But first, a shout out to our friends in the live chat, The Truth, Alicia B., Ruth Ann Griffin. She says, hi, Mike. Anytime, baby. Yep, anytime indeed. John Latanzio is here. He'll be on the show soon. Of course, another three-truck guy. Hey, John, looking forward to having you on. Christian Williams, anywhere, anytime, he says. Uh, Michalina Serino is here, of course. Hey, Michalina. And uh, Billy Ryan, retired NYPD first grader. 
uh, detective, of course, out of the, um, uh, not emergency service unit, excuse me, the arson and explosion squad, where he spent 13 okay. to 20 years. So, hey, Billy, uh, good to see you as always, my friend. So you worked the first seven years, seven years, 10 years, rather, in the 7-5, I should say, from 86 to 96. That was a busy time. You give us 22 minutes, we'll give you a homicide, was the motto of the precinct, because it was rocking. So getting in there, I imagine, listen, when you're young, you want the work. I mean, even though you're not happy to see these homicides, just out of the, sh out of the sheer call volume that that precinct was getting, I'm sure you were happy to be there. Um, well, at first, I wasn't too sure. I was in NSU 18 in Queens uh, right after the police academy. And there was a car pursuit from the 106 uh, right into the 75. And, of course, we joined the car pursuit. Well, they dumped out of the car and they went to the Fountain Avenue houses. And uh, the detective that was breaking me in, I was like, what command is this? And he goes, this is a 7-5. I go, this is the last place that I want to go to because they were, they were taking the guys out of the housing project and people were yelling and screaming at us, uh, throwing things out the window. And I was like, wow, the 7-5. Well, a couple of weeks later, we got the uh, sheet telling us what commands we were going to go to. And I looked it down and it said, uh, David Brink, 7-5. I was like, oh, God, I'm going to die. Here I am, this 21-year-old kid. I'm going to go to the 7-5. And, oh, man. But, you know, in retrospect, uh, you're 100% right. I was so glad that I went to the 7-5. It gave me the good building blocks. We worked with a good bunch of cops that were there. Um, a lot of them were from Vietnam. They were there from the uh, the war years, you know, the Black Panther times, um, the 70s into the 80s, and right at the height of the crack wars. That's when I kind of got there. And the call volume was very, very high. As you said before, if you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you a homicide. We had the shirts made up. We were all wearing them coming in. And uh, some people in the command weren't too happy because they're like, oh, well, you know, we don't want to be associated with that. But it was kind of like a, a camaraderie thing. And I wish I still had the shirt because there's one on eBay right now selling for $200. So, but the, uh, the strip call, the, the call volume that was going through the 705, I believe we were in backlog all the time during the summer. And uh, if you don't know what backlog is, that's when they're holding jobs. Uh, for the for the precinct units that were there. And I think the most jobs I and my old partner ever did in one night was 55. Um, yeah, 55 jobs. I still have it in the uh, memo book. Um, they would call in, you know, shots fired, drug sales. We would go there. We'd take a look around, ask for a description. And if we didn't see anything going on, we'd return the call and said, all right, Central, give us the next one. And off we went to another job in our sector. There was many, many nights that we used to eat our dinners or lunch on our laps because meals were denied, you know, because we were holding so many jobs. It was crazy. But um, we used to have so many homicides there. I think we had 131 in 91 or 93 um, a long time ago. And if you were good enough, you would be able to have a homicide cleaned up probably in a couple of hours, not a long time. Now it, it takes a long, long time, but you call out the squad. You call out EMS, they'd pronounce, the squad would come out, they'd start banging on doors. You would fill out your complaint report, your aided card, and your 95 tag for the uh, deceased individual. And you could have it cleaned up if the medical examiner came and took them off the street because they're in public view, probably within an hour or two, which was unbelievable. And you tell other commands, you know, like, oh, no, we're there all night. And I'm like, oh, no, not for the other guys. The 75 squad was the finest in clearing homicides and working homicide scenes ever. The guys that came out of the 7-5 were absolutely the best. You know, uh, they went to many, many different commands. Uh, a lot of guys that we had in emergency service came from the 7-5, uh, either bosses or regular cops. And the rest of them went to different uh, commands, but they were the best of the best from the 7-5. You learned on the job. You know, you really did. A lot more than guys that would go to an easier command. Um, it, was, it would be nice to work in those commands, but you're not going to get the call volume and the work that we did and the on-the-job training, especially from the vets. No, absolutely. It's not the same as if you work in a quiet sector in Staten Island or a quiet part of Queens. I mean, it's unfortunate that these things are happening, like I mentioned right. earlier. But at the same time, it is a bit of a double-edged sword in that your instincts and your skills are sharpened as a result of working so many of this because it becomes well, it becomes repetitive first, and then after a while, it becomes second nature. Exactly. And you had a lot um, over the guys from the easier commands. Um, I'm not going to name them. You guys right. know who you are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's good. Listen, our job was tough no matter where you worked. Right. Um, but we would go to a big detail, and they would save us for um, the reserve. Say if we went to uh, a riot or something like that. We went to Crown Heights. We were up in Washington Heights. And they're like going, oh, you guys from the 7-5? Yeah, yeah, stand by. We're not using you guys. 
But unfortunately, when it went down, you know, if they started throwing bottles at a commander or something like that, they'd say, where's the 7-5? Go in and charge them. So we would come out in two vanfuls of guys, and, you know, they'd want to use the 7-5 because we've been there and done that, you know. Mm, exactly. Yes. You know, and, and to your point earlier about the high call volume and handling so many jobs, you know, there's only so many cops available on a, on a given patrol shift, whether it's the 8 to 4, the 4 to 12, the 12 to 8. You know, so as far as, the, I mean, it's not your job to dispense it. That was a sergeant or a lieutenant or even the inspector of the precinct's job. But for you on the ground, as as the guys from FD and PD sometimes refer to it, the grunt on the ground, if you will, how were those different jobs dispersed throughout between you and your partner and the other set of officers throughout the precinct? Well, you'd have to handle your sector. If you didn't handle it, you'd have issues when you got back, especially if involved in arrest. Um, so if they were holding one for shoplifting and it was in your sector, you better go. Another job that nobody wanted to do was missing persons. Uh, missing person job could take you a long time because there's a lot of telephone me uh, telephone messages, that notifications you had to make. And a lot of times other city agents wouldn't pick up the phone. And you weren't allowed to hand in the missing persons report until you had all these notifications made. Who did you call at this agency, that agency, you know, so they could start looking for this missing person. So generally, if it came over the radio and it was in your sector, you had to handle it or an adjoining sector. That's pretty much how it was handled. Um, if it was a 13, a 1013, which meant the officer in trouble, 1085, uh, an officer would be, you know, saying officer needs assistance. Everybody would run, you know, to that job. Absolutely. But for the, uh, other jobs, it was up to you. You know, past burglary reports, you'd have to handle those. Yeah. So uh, Dave Ring is our guest tonight. This is Volume 9, like I said, of the E-Men inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit. We're closing in on the milestone Volume 10 for a miniseries that started on a whim uh, last summer. So it's been great talking to these great e-cops. So, you know, this conversation happens as well in ESU. We're going to handle how we're going to do here. How are we going to handle this? I think we're going to need this tool for this job. We'll get to that later. But as far as on patrol, there's such a variety of jobs, especially in a command like that, that where you're in the car and you have your partner with you, whoever it may be, you know, depending on the job, take me through what the conversation is, at least on patrol, of what you want to do, or at least try to do, once you get to any given scene. Well, the number one main conversation that you had, as soon as you came out of roll call and you tossed that car for any illegal contraband in the back is, what are we eating tonight? Okay, or what are we having for lunch? That's the God's honest truth, you know? And uh, we would go in into any other given jobs, depending on what it is. After a long time of riding with the same partner, year in, year out, tour in, tour out, um, you got to know each other's idiosyncrasies, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses were. So we go into family disputes, and it was like, okay, my old partner, he would take one person aside, start talking to them. I would take the other guy, start talking to him. And if he started faltering, if I started faltering, we would go in and help him out, and we would just take care of it. One of the biggest things we went to in the summer five was family disputes. You know, so that was kind of tricky because um, woman might call on her husband saying, yeah, he's hitting me, he's hitting me. And you're like, yeah, he lumped you up pretty good. We have to make the arrest. And as soon as you started putting the handcuffs on him, then she would turn on you because you're taking away the breadwinner of the house, you know? And it's like, oh boy, lady, we're trying to help you here. And here you are turning on us, you know, not good, but uh, we do the best we can. They're probably the most dangerous jobs you're ever going to face uh, in the city to this day. I don't care if you're in, you know, Illinois, California, New York, family disputes are the worst because it's their house you're entering their realm and they've got weapons all over the place that you don't even know about. You know? Right. And that came home to roost, as you saw, uh, tragically in January with uh, Rivera and Morrow in Harlem. You know, absolutely it was heartbreaking. Yeah. That whole thing. Oh, God, it just makes everybody want to cry. You know, it's, it's yeah. a horrible, horrible job. You know, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but to your point, I mean, if you're out in the community, naturally, some of these faces for good reasons and bad simultaneously do become familiar uh, to you. Now, it's not the same as a detective that needs his or her CIs, you know, and you have to give and take with them a little bit in order to build your cases and make sure that you got valuable intel going into a case. But nonetheless, out on patrol, like I said, you see so many of the same faces, either because, hey, it's a kid going to school. Hey, how you doing, Sonny? You, you keeping your grades up, things like that? Or it's, hey, you again, come on, let's take you to the precinct. So as far as the bonds, the good bonds that you would create, um, within your community. Tell me about how important that was for you and some of the more rewarding experiences, if any, that you had as a result of that. Well, no, it's always good to build that up, especially within your sector. Um, mm -hmm. We had our frequent flyers, as you would say, the same family disputes, the same people calling for the drug dealers. 
But you know something? There's a lot, a lot of good people that depend on you in those commands. They want you there. They need you there. They just want to live a good life. And not everybody's bad. You know, it's not the cops versus the community. We have to work together in, you know, conjunction of uh, fighting crime or doing that. And a lot of times you'd be friends with these people, uh, the elderly, and they would tell you a lot of things that you wanted to know. It's like, oh, did you hear there's a stolen car that's over here in the corner? Or this guy did so-and-so. And then we would just go up to the detective squad and we would give them the information that we would garner from our friends out in the community. Right. There you go. That's the best way to do it, because yeah. after a while, there is that trust factor that does build up over time. And you can even goof around with them. Hey, yo, Brink, you know how it is. You know, certain guys, oh. there goes Brink. You give you, you give it and you take it. It happens down here in New Haven, too. But at the end of the day, it's all in good fun. And that person knows, hey, you know, he's got my back and, and they can see past the uniform and they can see the human behind it. Exactly. Because right. if I was out there and for some reason I couldn't go over the radio and call for a 1085 or a 1080, they would. Hopefully call the, you know, 911 saying, hey, there's a cop over here having a bunch of problems trying to cuff somebody up. If I was out there on the street patrol, uh, you know, a foot beat or something like that, you have to build that rapport up with those guys, you know. Right. Right. You know, because at the end of the day, you talk about the same thing with family disputes. You're coming into their home that, you know, they're, that's their neighborhood. And especially if you're it's one thing if you're a native and you work your way up and they've known you your whole life, kind of like what I was talking about with Rick Martinez when he was on. Hey, yeah, that's Rick. We've known him since he was a boy. But if you're coming out there from a totally different background, you got to kind of to an extent I'm speaking generally, you got to humble yourself a little bit and, and realize, hey, this is not my territory. The best my best asset, one of them, at least. Let me learn where they're coming from. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I said before, that's their, uh, you know, it's their home, their realm. And we're coming in there as a guest to try to um, mitigate an emergency that they're having, you know, whether it be a family dispute or something else. We're going in there just trying to solve a problem. That's all we're doing. And um, you don't want to be viewed as like an occupying army or something like that. Oh, you know, you're a white cop and I'm a, a caller. It's like, oh, we, you know, we don't go in with an attitude. It's like, oh, hey, what's going on? How can we help you? You know, like it says on the side of the car, you know, service. So that's what we're there to provide a service and try to do the best job you can. Right, exactly. A couple more shout outs in the live chat. Joseph Conway's tuning in via LinkedIn. Of course, we are live on LinkedIn as well as YouTube. Hey, Joe, uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. And Bob Geis, retired second grade detective. Quit ducking me, Bob. Come on the show. I want to have you on the show, pal. So that brings us to 1996. Now, I'm getting a look, Bob. 1996, you know, you go to STS, which for those of you that uh, don't know, it stands for Specialized Training School, which is where these E-men and E-women are bred and subsequently dispensed out to whatever, whichever the 10 trucks that exist throughout the city, or maybe they stay at Floyd Bennett Field and do various duties there. So for you, I mean, by this point, you got a lot of, well, fair enough. You're basically halfway through your career, 10 years in, a lot of experience. Most cops are going in there with five, which is still pretty decent, but less, obviously. What made you, was it the other guys that you had seen that you worked with in the 7-5 that had gone on to ESU that made you want to go? I wanted to go to emergency service since the time I was in um, the police academy. You can look at my academy book right now. It still has the ESU sticker on there, and that was really the motivating factor for me. Uh, being a volunteer firefighter, we have a certain skill set that we can bring to emergency service, and that helped me out during my interview. Um, it was very, very tough to get into emergency. Now, don't forget, uh, at the height of the NYPD, the amount of personnel, we had 35,000 cops and only about 350 ESU personnel. So it's 1%. It's very, very tough, very, very competitive to get in. Um, you have to be, you know, the sharpest of the sharp to get in there. Um, and I had two bribery arrests from the 7-5 to get in, an exemplary sick record and also an arrest record. I never went sick at all. And the two bribe collars uh, also helped, helped me out a lot in getting to emergency service. And I had my application, and as soon as I could go, and uh, I was finally picked thank God, you know, and then went to the specialized training school in 1996. Each borough presents a different challenge, you know, and that's why if you go to ESU, I don't think anybody's going to complain. Nah, man, I went to 10 truck instead of one truck. No, because everything uh, in, in, like I said, in each borough, it's different. No two days are the same as many E-men and, and E-women have told me. And there's always uh, a lot of excitement, even if you're not going out on calls, drilling back at the at the command just to make sure that you stay sharp. And your first command was truck three in the South Bronx. I mean, this is, you know, it's the South Bronx, even as crime has lowered over the years, remains a busy place. So going out there where these guys had seen so much, they're not that far removed from the Larry Davis incident. They're not too far removed from other incidents of a similar nature. 
I mean, you had to you had to feel like a kid in a candy shop walking in there. Yeah, I um, I really at first I didn't want to go to three truck. I wanted to stay down in Brooklyn in the right. in seven truck because that's where I really cut my teeth in the seven five. So I knew the streets. I wanted to stay in seven. Uh, I got my marching orders. Go to three truck. They need the help. A lot of us went up there from the specialized training school uh, class that I graduated with. We, and then we went to three truck. Uh, in retrospect, the Bronx was an awesome place to work in. Uh, they had as much work as anybody. We had a lot of uh, pin jobs, you know, people getting stuck in autos because we had all the major um, highways going through. You know, the, we had the Clearview, the Cross Bronx. We had 95. Uh, we had them all right there. So we specialized in doing that. It was good because you can get from one place to another in the Bronx relatively quick. Right. Uh, say if you were in Brooklyn or Queens, it'd be a hot job, you know, a perp job or some rescue that you wanted to make. And it took you a long time to get there just because of the sheer size of the boroughs. And a lot of times you get there, either the job was already over, um, the fire department had completed or another truck. But right. in the Bronx, it was pretty tight because we can get there pretty quickly and mitigate whatever was uh, coming our way. Before we continue, uh, Joe Conway is in the chat, like I mentioned earlier, and he wants to know, do you remember a Harvey from the 7-5? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. All right. There you go. So, Joe, there you go. Uh, Harvey, I don't know what Harvey is referring to, but it must have been an interesting guy. Last, last name. Yeah, I didn't want to mention any names uh, on here. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. You don't have to. Yeah, exactly. You leave his last name on it. You know, keeping everybody thinking about it. But, yeah, I remember Harvey from the 705. Yes. <laughs> there you go. So that answers you. I hope that answers your yep. question, Joe. So, of course, like I said, 97 to 07 in three truck, and you can get anywhere pretty quickly. And I remember the A&E documentary that was featured uh, or that featured, yeah, I should say, ESU being shot between 1999 and 2000, centering on three and four truck a little bit. And there was a lot of, and we'll focus on the first aspect of ESU here, a lot of EDP jobs. Each EDP job is different, like if they got a weapon and they've committed a criminal act and then that's handled differently. All of them equally dangerous, but some of them, unfortunately, are just people who are otherwise, when they're on their medication, normal people, but unfortunately are not. They have that breakdown, doesn't make them a bad person. They're sick, they can't help it. But nonetheless, you have to go in there and safely assess the situation. Now, I mean, it's a lot different from back then in the 70s and the 80s. Now, at least we started to see this in the 90s. I know you probably saw it when you first got there. We have cameras, we have abilities to see into the apartment. Taru is there to offer assistance. It doesn't mean the job's easier per se, there's still a lot of danger, but it helps to have these additional tools. So as far as that aspect of ESU with the EDPs, Tell me about the process to making sure that it came out in, in, a, good, in a good fashion. Well, in the, one of the first things we would do, if we had a barricade EDP, um, say if mom called, yeah, my son's not taking his meds, he's inside the apartment, he is going to uh, not come out easily, one of the first things we used to do is we would take the peephole. Um, so uh, it was one way, you know, fisheye coming out into the, to see who's in the hallway. But for us, we have to look inside. So we used to take a set of irons, we take out the peephole, and we take a look inside. We've got quick view mirrors. We've also got uh, cameras that can go inside now and take a look around. A lot of times if we started banging on the doors, the EDP would come to the door and we'd try to make a rapport with them. We would have the uh, body bunker in front of the door just in case we decide to shoot at us, which has been done in the past. Um, we'd have that and we'd try to say, hey, what's going on? How you doing? What's going on? And uh, oftentimes they would talk to us. Sometimes they didn't, you know, just barricade the door. They didn't want to come out, you know, but uh, right. we just want to get a good line of communication with them and right. see what was making them tick, what was bothering them and see how we could take care of it and take them out, you know, in one piece living, you know. Right. And I think at a job like this, ESU calls the shots to an extent because I was having this conversation as well with Cambria. If it's a hostage, hostage situation, yeah, they're there. Taru's there. EMS is there on a lesser level because they still got to bring them to the hospital. But they're not assisting with the tactical aspect. I mean, obviously, you weren't a boss, so whoever the sergeant was, that's their job to kind of mitigate it. But nonetheless, a patrol officer in ESU does have certain things that he or she can say, hey, can you do this for me? I think it would help if we did this. Anytime you were in that situation and you had those other units there, especially EMS that has to handle the, the hospitalization aspect, what would you tell them? Hey, can you do whatever it is for me? Yeah, a lot of times if somebody has a good rapport with the uh, person on the other side of the door, we're going to let them talk. Mm -hmm. If they're kind of like faltering or, you know, not, you know, making any headway, we might step in and do some talking. I used to love negotiating with people on the other side of the door. It's, uh, it's, 
something I wanted to go to H N T afterwards. But uh, okay. we have guys in the command or a person on patrol. Oh, I know this guy. You know, I'm like going, all right, go ahead, keep talking to him. You know, you're doing good. You're doing good. We'd have the uh, heavy vests and helmets on us. We'd have the ballistic protection. But if somebody was making headway, like I said, we'd let them talk. And if they stopped, then we'd kind of like give them some hints and hey, what's going on? You know, we'd, we'd say, back off a little bit. Let me try this. And we try going in from a different angle. Right. That helps. And then you go from that now, of course, into the perp jobs. And it's something that I've covered before with the warrants. You got to serve these warrants on these guys. And not only that, sometimes, you know, it's situations in which cops are being fired on, or we know this guy's pretty violent, or we know this guy has vicious dogs or whatever. He's known to resist an assault. And that obviously creates an added danger because you have somebody that clearly doesn't respect any kind of authority, doesn't have any self-respect in that regard to conduct themselves that way in the first place. So going through these jobs, even if you are suited up tactically and you have everything on your side gear-wise, cops can still get hurt in that unit. Cops can still get killed. It's happened. So as far as the perp jobs, depending on the perp, especially if they had not even a weapon in the form of a gun, which everybody thinks of, but a knife or, like I said, dogs, what was the procedure there for you and 3 truck? Well, we want to make sure that we're all uh, safe um, as we were going in. Also, you know, you have to have a helmet on, your ballistic vest, your uh, body bunker, make sure that everybody was armed. And <clears throat> going in, we just had to follow the pro proper tactics. We all went through the same training, so we basically know what kind of moves we're going to make. Uh, going in, we'd ha we try to get some intel on where the apartment ran, which way it would go, break left, break right. We try to get some intel on where the guy was. Um, if he was armed, you know, talking to his uh, confidential informant, and uh, we just go into the apartment that way. We just try to be as safe as we can. Uh, do they fire back at us? Sometimes, yeah. Most times, no. And, you know, in my past experiences, the guys that said they were worse than King Kong, they weren't going to jail, those were the guys that would put their hands up first as soon as we breached the door. They'd be like, okay, I give up. You know, I don't have a gun or anything like that. It was the, uh, the guys that didn't talk. Those were the ones you really had to watch out for. Right. It's sometimes the guys that are talking, their bark is worse than their bite. Exactly. But it's the guys that are, as you said, you hit the nail on the head, they're dead silent. Those are the ones that usually give you a, a mountain of trouble. And you know what's interesting is that particularly on a warrant, if you're going to go serve it on somebody, let's say it's a contract killer, let's say it's somebody that's off their rocker and has weapons on top of that, or like we said, somebody that uh, is a drug dealer and doesn't want to go back to jail. I wonder, and tell me about this, the element of surprise is big. You guys don't pull up with sirens because that's a dead giveaway. But people are, people are looking out the windows. They could see the big truck. If you guys aren't using the big truck and you're in a van, they've seen that van around enough times. They know, oh, I think that's ESU. And you could lose somebody that way because they might say, yo, you might want to ditch because they're coming. When it comes to that aspect, what would you guys, without giving any secrets of the trade away, of course, what right. would you guys do to mitigate that? Well, first of all, you're right. We wouldn't come in lights and sirens blaring, obviously saying, hey, we're on the way, guys. You know, we're playing the theme from SWAT on uh, 10 coming out of the speakers. Um, we used to go in, if it was a regular warrant, we'd go in the morning times, okay, uh, before everybody would be waking up. Lights would be out. We'd stack up. We'd, be, we'd go as quietly as we could uh, as we left the truck. When I was in the apprehension team, they had unmarked trucks. Nobody knew who exactly we were. We could have been the bread guy making a delivery. And we walk in, and sometimes they will look out and they'd see, and you'd hear the whistling and yelling, 5050. And sometimes the windows would come open, and you just get streamed down upon with uh, drugs, guns, other things. And we just, you know, make our presence known, and we go to the floor. I'm not going to get really into our tactics so far because I don't want anybody getting hurt from what I say. But, uh, and then we make entry into the uh, targeted apartment. There is, of course, the aspects of rescue, and you guys are really at your core. I mean, you do it all, of course, ESU. That's why I love talking to you guys. It's a service unit. And the service is there is your middle name, of course. As some guy, some someone who will be on the show soon told me off the air as we get closer, let me know who that was for the audience out there. But um, that said, I mean, a lot of it's not just the EDPs that you have to rescue sometimes from themselves. I mean, the bridges are nearby. There is water nearby. But I think what's interesting about Truck 3 is, at least in the conversations I've had with the other guys, you guys had a lot of fires. Now, do you have fire jurisdiction? No, obviously, you'd basically supplement the FDNY. But nonetheless, as far as knowing the makeup of given buildings, if you have to go in there and they say, hey, can you guys help us make grabs? Tell me about that, because I don't think I've ever covered that with you guys to this point. No, well, you know, we do pretty much everything but fight fires. Um, yeah. We do have the Scott packs that the firefighters are wear. We do have our hard hat helmets. Yeah. But other than that, we don't have the Nomex Kevlar um, suits that the firefighters right. have, uh, the fire protection, nor do we have the hoses. We do have fire extinguishers. 
So we could put out a small fire. Um, I haven't been called out to too many fires where we actually went in and started making grabs. Uh, we might be driving by when we saw a fire and we'd evacuate the building to try to get people out. But as far as the fires are concerned, they had total jurisdiction and that was their realm. And we were like, okay, fellas, here you go. You know, have at it. But it was right. really the specialized rescues uh, that we would do. Uh, if you had a person entrapped, we would use uh, the hearse tool, you know, otherwise known as the jaws of life, to get people out of cars. Uh, if somebody was trapped in elevators or machinery, that's where our expertise really came in. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, first come, first serve. We would go in. If FD was there and they couldn't uh, affect the rescue, we would go in and help. Hey, guys, why don't we try it this way? Or we'd take in uh, different tools and we'd oftentimes free the person that was trapped. Given the amount of house, public housing that exists in the Bronx, were elevator jobs the most common jobs you went on rescue-wise? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Elevators, anybody who lived in the projects in the Bronx or any borough for that matter knows how many times the elevators go down. We merged with guys from transit, um, emergency rescue, and also housing rescue. And you know which um, commands those guys came to first before they came to emergency service on NYPD. And I knew the guys that were in housing. And I would talk to them, try to pick their brain, or let them take the lead on how to get these people out of the elevators, because elevators were a dangerous environment to work into. You had counterweights, you had doors that would, you know, close in on you, and you had to be very, very careful because a lot of people lost their life trying to get in or out of elevators. Uh, believe me, yeah. it just wasn't about having a set of drop keys or a tit key, and you'd get inside the door. Oftentimes, you'd have to go to the floor below with an elevator pole, open up the door manually, and get the people out. Especially if they're having a medical issue, it was kind of uh, labor intensive, but you'd have to get them out as quickly as you could. Um, and we would finesse it. You know, some other commands might take an axe or something else and break down the door or force the door open. And then the elevator was messed up for everybody for a long time because they'd have to call in the elevator mechanics, have them fix uh, the doors. But the way we would do it, we'd finesse it a little bit with the keys. And the elevator was often back in service uh, that same day. And a lot of the elderly people were very thankful, I'm sure, because they can get, you know, back and forth, getting their groceries and get back to their sixth floor apartment, you know, on Soundview Avenue or wherever we were that day. So let's stay on that for a second, because sometimes you have to go in there. If the shaft is down, I know there's been instances where guys got to go in on the ropes that the elevator shaft has and kind of move downward, which is very dangerous because you have the cars above you. And talk about something that would make me pee my pants. Uh, so yeah. in, in situations like that where you're, you know, in this precarious position that, you know, ton, steel ton card is above you. You have this elevator that's out of whack below you. How would that be managed to affect a rescue? Well, we'd shut down the power to the elevators so they would stay where they were. We've got different clamps that we could use to stop the uh, cars, keep them up there in their location. And then we'd open up the uh, ground floor door and we could put down a ladder. All right. Because we have ladders on our trucks and we put down a ladder, you know, getting us down into the uh, shaft. And that's where we secure the patient, put them in a, um, you know, a Stokes basket, and then we'd hoist them up that way and get the person out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, besides that, I mean, I, I have to ask, okay, you know, there is a lot of animals in, uh, throughout New York City as well. Sometimes, unfortunately, people's pets get stuck. Sometimes people have weird pets, as in the case of 2003 with that infamous uh, tiger job. And Martin Duffy was, I don't know if he's still active, but if he's retired, I got to try to find him and get him on this show. So in the instance that you have something like that, where, you know, listen, pets mean a lot too. Um, what, what are some of the more notable animal rescues, if you were ever on one, which I'm sure you were, that you can recall? Well, we had, uh, well, issue, we control a lot of the animal control. Uh, we, had, we do have animal control going out throughout the city, but mm -hmm. we've got certain tools. Uh, we've got catch-all poles. We've got uh, the darts. We've got ketamine on board uh, that we use to tranquilize the dogs. Uh, sometimes you get dogs that are like Cujo, and they've bitten up their owners pretty bad. Uh, we've got wild dogs just running around the uh, neighborhood. One of the stories I had was it was a German shepherd uh, that was scaring a lot of the neighbors up in Three Trucks area, right off of Soundview Avenue. And uh, we had to dart him because he was on the run. So I prepared up a dart. I have it in the rifle, the air rifle. And I get ready to shoot the dog with the air uh, rifle. So the, um, the dart is in there. And I'm trying to lead him a little bit because he's walking like a deer. I shoot. We have a lot of people that are going out there because they're afraid of the dog. So they're watching me from afar. They're hiding behind cars. And there I am, uh, the guy that was breaking me in. I shoot him with the dart. And the dart's going in. And the dog is moving. Well, the charge wasn't as strong as I thought it was. So it kind of like stopped a little bit. And it was dropping in trajectory. 
and unfortunately it hit the male German shepherd right in the penis. Um, so all the men that were there started to uh, grab themselves in an appropriate place going, oh God, the cop just shot him in the penis. And I'm like, oh man, I felt bad for the dog. The dog lets out this howl and the drugs start to take uh, effect on this dog. He's walking around not knowing what he's doing. The dog is hanging out of him. And I'm like, oh, oh God, dog, I'm so sorry I did this. Well, once the dog was tranquilized, he was out in La La Land. And unfortunately, we've got to recover these darts because we don't have a lot of darts in the dart tips. Uh, we've got a finite number. So it was up to me to retrieve this dart. Okay, here I am uh, taking the dart out of the dog's penis, and I recovered it. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I can't believe it. Because you want to shoot for the uh, largest part of the dog, which is generally the chest area or his side, you know, and get him. And those are a lot easier. But, oh, boy, what a place for this dart to land. And I didn't aim for it, believe me, because I'm not a good shot with that thing. You know, so that was one of the uh, the more memorable uh, animal control jobs that I've taken place on, you know. I just got a bulletin here that says, and uh, the dog was shortly neutered after that. <laughs> uh, yes, he was. Absolutely. But, you know, we mm. handled a lot of uh, animal jobs, uh, especially if you remember the polar bear jobs from down in Brooklyn. You know, not mm-hmm. a job that I was on myself because that was before emergency. But unfortunately, the kids were in the, uh, the Prospect Park Zoo. And they decided to go swimming with the polar bears. That was one of the jobs. And unfortunately, emergency service guys from uh, Brooklyn had to put down the door, uh, the the uh, bears, the polar bears. Uh, we've had all kinds of jobs. We've had sea lions uh, come up uh, in the Bronx, and we had one stranded where we had to, yeah, actually, right by City Island. We uh, got them, and we put them back in the uh, water, you know. We've had deers come down the Bronx River Parkway, uh, you know, down the river. And they were stuck in the water. We had to get them out. You know, all kinds of cows. You name the animal, we've taken care of them. Bats, squirrels, um, and that, not to mention rats. They were all over the place. We wouldn't do those guys. But, uh, yeah, all kinds. And uh, we kind of specialize in that. A lot of raccoons, possums. And, uh, you know, we mitigate it. A possum would crawl in somebody's house, and we have to get them out. They're all bark, no bite. They would just hiss at you for a while, you know, and that was it. Right. No, of course. And I think one one other aspect of rescue, just to, before I move on to the other uh, aspects of ESU as well, and then Dave brings our guest tonight. He, uh, he is for Volume 9, uh, the NYPD miniseries that we have on the show for the Mike New Haven podcast, the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit, you know, is also the ice rescues. Because during the winter, sometimes kids, you know, even adults, too, they're trying to have fun. They're trying to go skate on something that has become frozen. But the ice gives way because it's not naturally used to people being on. It's just a product of New York winters. It's gotten frozen, but it's not solid ground. They fall in. That's ice cold water. If they're not good swimmers, and even if they are good swimmers, that's a precarious position for them to be in. And you guys have had to make rescues like that, too. So if you were ever on a rescue like that, tell me about it. Yeah, well, um, if you get somebody who falls through the ice, uh, you got to get there pretty quickly. Once again, the lateral come into play. Uh, We'll put on our Gumby suits because it makes us look like Gumby. Uh, big orange gumbies uh, or a Mustang suit, and we'll go out there with our ice picks. Uh, ice picks are just generally broomsticks with nails coming out of the ends, so you can pull yourself on the ice. And you throw the picks to the guy and say, hey, listen, try to pull yourself up out of the hole. They can't do it. Grab a hold onto the ladder. Well, oftentimes, we're already roped up. So we'll go there, and we'll go by the victim that's in the water because they're very cold. You want to get to them before they lose consciousness and fall in because otherwise then we'd be – putting on our scuba suits and then going in you know, into there to try to rest them. Uh, but for the most part on the Bronx river or some of the lakes that we have up there, they do fall through, you know, it's a, uh, it's an attractive hazard, especially to the kids and they'll go skating or they'll just be walking around trying to, you know, crack through the ice. And sure enough, they do. A lot of times it'll happen in central park, but we get a couple of those jobs up in the Bronx from time to time. And uh, that's how we'll get them out. And then off the of Jacoby, they go warm them up and that's it. Hopefully they learned a lesson. You know, what's interesting about ESU as well is you called it flying earlier, and that's a term that sometimes, for those of you that don't know, a guy or a gal in ESU, if another truck, let's say they work in truck four in the in the, in the Bronx, if uh, truck one in Manhattan is short, they'll go out there and they'll spend the day or the two were in truck one assisting them so that they're not short in terms of manpower. So I've always found that interesting because not only do you get to work in your own command, which is exciting enough, as we've talked about to this point in truck three, sometimes you can go and see what the other guys are are dealing with in certain environments. What's it like in truck 10 in Queens? What's it like in truck five in Staten Island? What's it like in two truck in uh, Harlem, of course? And that leads to an interesting photo that we have here. And while I show this photo, 
and we'll talk about the photo momentarily. Take me through what it was like to, quote unquote, fly to other trucks. Well, there I am with uh, members from two truck. This is pre 9-11 um, because, unfortunately, three of the individuals that are in that photo are you know, not with us anymore. They died at uh, on 9-11. Uh, Joey Vidge, he's in the middle. Mike Curtin, Sergeant Curtin. Uh, he's a little bit to the right of uh, Joey Vidge and then John Delara. John was working with us up in three trucks. So I believe John and I came up to two truck to give them a hand. Um, so oftentimes when you first get to a truck, they'll keep you in the, in the truck that you're assigned to um, for the first week or two just to get your feet wet. You know, have one of the guys that are going to break you in, uh, start to get you going and say, OK, this is how we answer the radio. This is how we uh, do our jobs. And then after that. As a new guy, you're going to start a whole world of flying. And that's a good thing because you learn of all the guys that are working in your same squad across the city. Uh, so you meet a lot. And you also get to check out the different equipment that they have, uh, some of the different problems that they specialize in. Um, say if you go to one truck, they do a lot of rope jobs there, a lot of high angle stuff. You know, um, and, you know, it's a, it's a great place to work. Uh, two truck, they've got their issues, uh, and you know, four truck, which is right next door to us. So a lot of times if guys are say, if they go to the apprehension team, uh, for six months, they'll be running a little bit short in their squad. If guys are on the, that might be just one guy. It might be two guys. They might fly in the whole, uh, squad for that debt. Um, if they want to have a, a truck and an atom car, yeah, we're flying you guys into four truck because the guys are, you know, out hurt or on vacation or the apprehension team. Um, so, you know, a lot can be learned by flying and it's a lot of fun. Sometimes, the, you know, pain in the egg, like, Oh God, I'm flying again. Or if I go to two truck or whatever, but sometimes you eat really good. Uh, I would cook for them sometimes or we pick up some decent food. You know, if you want to try a restaurant in a different area, you know, in Brooklyn or Queens, uh, yeah, I'll take the fly. I want to go to uh, the bagel guy over in uh, Northern Queens, you know, get a great sandwich for the day. Uh, but you got to meet a lot of different guys working that way, you know, throughout, you know, I was in the third squad, so you'd get to know everybody on big jobs or if you're flying, oh, I know how that guy is, you know, these are his strong points. These might be his weak points. I don't know, but let's, you know, find out. So flying was really good. Yeah. And in that photo that I showed, of course, and I'll go back to it here, you talked about it. Uh, there's you with the mustache, of course, right next to you is John Delaire. And, and to your uh, left in the photo would be Danny Cohn, yeah, who will be on the show soon. You mentioned Joe Vigiano, Mike Curtin. Here's Greg Abate next to Sergeant Curtin. Greg, sadly, not with us anymore either. He later went out to the bomb squad, finished out his career, and he sadly passed away from a heart attack a number of years ago. So, yeah. you know, it's it's good to have those photos to, for their families because, you know, listen, as, as a way to kind of look back and keep the memory alive of these guys, um, it, it is uh, it is definitely a, a nice thing. So, you know, out, out on patrol, and I covered this when I had Maddie Lawrence on, the best thing about ESU is that when you go to SOD and other units, now that I'm knocking them, of course, they do great work, too, is that you lose the patrol aspect. Now, for some guys and gals, they're like, great, because they don't, you know, they don't want to be on patrol anymore. They want to move up in their career. But ESU always stays close to the roots of a cop. Where does every cop be begin before he or she goes to the detective bureau or here or there? Patrol. And you guys, even though you don't do it as much as patrol cops do, you still do it. So for you, getting to do that, in addition to obviously the heavy duty rescue work and EDPs and perp jobs, what were some of the more notable things that you were able to spot while out on patrol, especially in a neighborhood or in a, I should say a vicinity like the South Bronx? Well, we don't forget that REP, which is Radio Emergency Patrol, we'd be on patrol right next to these guys uh, from the different commands. And if we were running, say, like the truck, they would generally stay inside quarters and wait for us to pull them out because they had all the uh, weapons on board. They had all the specialized equipment. We would have the Adam car, the boy car, the trolley car. And we would be dispersed throughout the uh, command, um, the commands that encompass the uh, east side of the Bronx. That was for three truck. On the other side of the, um, the Cross Bronx Expressway or Bronx River Parkway would be on one side. Four truck for the most part would be on the other. And you want to be dispersed in those commands just so, A, you'd have a rapid response in case if uh, there were shots fired. Uh, B, well, uh, if, they, if you were called or if you had to effect a rescue, you wanted to be up there because it would take you some time to get through traffic. We all know the Cross Bronx is, or the, you know, the Bronx River Parkway is just clogged up full of traffic, especially if there's a pin job. It's going to say if we had a uh, pin job running northbound on 95 and you were all the way up top, 
you'd come down with no traffic, no problem, and you'd be able to affect the rescue faster than, say, if the truck was coming in through the south side from where the quarters was, it might be held up in traffic. You know, even though you could ride the, um, you know, the side of the road or whatever like that, or the, uh, the grass, it would be better if you were dispersed out there. As far as patrol goes, um, oftentimes we have shots fired. Uh, We're having some technical difficulties with Dave, so we'll wait for him to come back real quick while uh, he uh, sorts that out. Okay, he's back. Let me put him back in. Lost you there for a second. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So Wally would say, hey, these are the hot spots. You know, we'd go to these projects or something. We'd listen for the shots fired on White Plains Road. And a lot of times we're like, yeah, Adam, you know, boy three, we got shots fired, you know, and we'd be like one of the first ones on scene. You know, we'd have the 4-7 come over to our location. So it was really important for us to be out on patrol. Uh, because we're just another set of eyes and ears for the commands that were uh, that we served. Right. And it's not like, you know, if you're out on patrol in ESU and you see some, a blatant crime, like a robbery taking place in front of you. Officer, help me. Sorry, I'm in ESU. I don't do it anymore. No, get get off and help. Guess what? Guess what? We do it. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what they would do is if we saw a crime of progress or something going on, we would stop, of course, you know, affect the arrest. But when we'd have our supervisor come down, who's probably a citywide north supervisor, and he get together with like a precinct supervisor, goes, hey, listen, if I lose this officer to make an arrest here in the Bronx, I'm not going to have a, an Adam car or a boy car. So they would pretty much reassign the collar to a, uh, you know, to a, a newer guy, uh, a rookie from that command. He would say, hey, listen, just tell him you know, the facts and circumstances of the case, what happened. Like, hey, listen, this is what I saw. Or there was an assault that took place. You know, somebody got hit. Or, you know, to that extent, and then they would take the collar from us. Um, we didn't make any arrest in emergency service for the most part. Mm -hmm. And if we did a warrant and there were people that were placed under arrest, we would get the handcuffs from the detectives in narcotics or from the warrant squad, uh, the detective squads. And we'd say, OK, this is where we found them. This guy was in the living room. Uh, this guy was over here. They're your cuffs, your collar. Uh, make sure you toss them well. We give them a quick toss for a gun, but just do a secondary search. And then the arrest is yours, you know, and that's what we did. We just wanted to secure the scene, you know, that's all. No, of course. And, and Latanzio puts in the chat, it did put a sense of security when we rolled up on their job. Like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I know it would for me if I was in their position. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to have a, uh, you know, fully armed emergency service team coming up. It gave you uh, an edge, you know, to have a submachine gun up there just in case something happened or a long gun as opposed to everybody's, you know, nine millimeters or back in the early days of 38s. But yeah, it definitely was, John. I know you're listening down in Florida. Um, it, it definitely was. I when I was in the, on patrol in the seven five, when some of the guys from seven truck would pull up, I'd be mm -hmm. like, "Okay, cool," because we'd have a problem on the corner, and they'd come out, rack around in a shotgun, and everybody'd be like backing off, or they'd start to disperse. I'm like, "Going, all right, there you go. Good job, emergency. You know, they're helping <laughs> us out on patrol, and that's what we were there for. We were to help out uh, the patrol <laughs> guy. You know, we'd never turn down a job from them." No matter how obscure, how crazy the job was, we'd get it done for them. Because if we didn't help them, they were stuck, you know. Right. And we all remembered how it was to be on patrol, and you don't want to get stuck. You don't want to be stuck, all right. So emergency would help out. It's like going, "Hey, listen, uh, I just came out. Can you secure the door for me?" Absolutely. We take out our uh, our toolbox and whatever it needed to be done. We would secure the doors uh, for the cops and make their lives a lot easier. That's what we were there for to make their lives. Oh, easier. Of course. And that's the beauty of ESU is that if you talk to any E-man or any patrol cop that's had experiences with uh, emergency service, they don't say no. Even if it sounds trivial, all oh, my radio fell down the drain. Guys, fellas, can you give me a hand here? They're not going to say, nah, they, they, they don't, don't waste our time with that. No, they'll go and they'll do it. Because what, like I said earlier, service is the middle name of the unit. It's a service unit. You're there to assist anybody, anytime, anywhere. What's the limerick? Anytime, baby. Anytime, baby. That's right. Um, yeah. We... I can remember one Christmas day, I was working with one guy and uh, not mentioning names, but we were in, in quarters and it was snowing quite heavily. This is probably about 2002 and the four, three started coming in because they needed their chains put on RMPs, their radio motor pulse. Um, otherwise they were their repair was closed because it was Christmas. I said, come on in fellas. We pulled out the truck. We got the lift. We started lifting up cars one after another, after another. We started putting the chains on the cars, and there they go. That's all we did because it was very, very quiet for us uh, emergency service-wise. But for the patrol cops, it was busy. They're like, oh, we can't drive. 
we need to put the chains on. And unfortunately, they lack the resources. We had the jack, uh, the jack lifts, you know, that did lift up a NASCAR with or whatever like that, the floor jacks. We say, come on in, back up, put the chains on, off, here comes the next car. And we did that all afternoon until they can go out on patrol and, uh, you know, and do their jobs. You know, but no matter, like you said, no matter how obscure, my keys fell down here, my radio fell down here, guess what? We're going to take off that drain cap and put something down there and we're going to get out for you. Otherwise, <clears throat> we'll sit there until the job gets done. We'll pull in other resources just to make it happen. I know this is, an, and before I get to the, the biggest job that you ever worked in your career, I know this is a bit obscure, but when there's big, big, big jobs, everybody from all the uh, 10 trucks throughout the city goes, or at least most of them. When that crane collapse happened in Midtown in 98, remember that job? Was three truck on that? Some of the guys did go. Um, okay. I was not um, on that job. Uh, for the most part, but yeah, it, it hit the building. Uh, a lot of resources from out the city wide went down there. But don't forget, even if there is a big job, we still have to keep some of the resources back. Right. Because you don't want to have a cop need you and you're in a different borough because we stripped the entire city. Even during 9 11, everybody didn't go. Uh, we kept three truck, didn't respond. Uh, the Adam car did because that's where I was in. We were trucking out in that day. And the truck stayed, and they were going to some heavy, heavy jobs throughout northern Queens and the Bronx because there was nobody else to go to these jobs. But they still had barricaded EDPs, shots fired. They still had to respond, and it was just the two of them. You know, so kudos to those two that, that stayed there. But everybody, we couldn't strip the entire city and have everybody go out to 9-11. Right. So I guess that brings us to that morning. You were in the Adam car. And the guys from three, well, Vinny Dance had done a flyover. Vinny Dance was going to school for heavy machinery operations at night. And even though his normal command was three truck, he was over Mike Curtin's squad that day. And yeah, he, he went down with those guys. That's right. Um, yeah. That morning, I was supposed to work with Jerome Dominguez. We were heading to the range that day. But because it was the uh, primary elections, uh, we were taken off the range. And they were going to send us over to two truck. Um, while Lee Weaver was there, he was going to start working with, um, Mike Garcia and, uh, I had flown to two truck previously. They had some guys in the apprehension team and it was another guy on vacation. So two truck, uh, was pretty stripped that day. So we sent three guys over there. Um, while had said to me, Dave, you know, you went there yesterday, I'm going to go over with Jerome and, you know, stay here and break in, um, you know, Mike Garcia. And I said, yeah, no problem. I, I broke in Wally. I broke in Jerome. There was a lot of guys that broke in. And I was, you know, like the third senior guy in the squad uh, that day. So they were going. And I was in the Adam car, Adam 3 on 9-11. Um, we were going to head down with uh, Mike Garcia. And, uh, I, you know, I remember because Wally had gotten there in 98 from patrol. Jerry had gotten there the year after in 99. And Jerry had had, like, he used to carry around rescue tools in his car which is one of the things that made him attractive to ESU to come down there. And it's funny, you know, because I guess he had been a bigger guy previously and he was so dedicated and wanted to get into ESU. That guy worked himself into the best shape of his life. Yeah. Uh, Jerome, he was in highway. Um, he was in highway yeah. up in the Bronx. He was a big motorcycle guy and he wanted to, he was in, uh, he wanted to do highway rescue. Um, he came over to emergency service and he was a bigger guy, but there's certain physical standards that you have to do just to get into the unit. You know, you can't be a big, uh, heavy dude and uh, come in because you do have to, um, you got to run the mile a certain amount of time. You have to do other things. And you also got to be able to handle the hearse tools and get into vests and uh, get into tight spaces, such as, um, you know, confined spaces. And he wanted it really, really bad. Uh, so he worked out. He did what he had to do to get in. I mean, he was an Air Force uh, reservist mm -hmm. uh, up at Stewart, up in, um, you know, not Rockland, Westchester County, at the airport up there. So he wanted to get into emergency the worst way. And I'm glad he did. He was a, uh, a solid individual, and uh, he was a good guy all around. Yeah. You know? So I guess in that Adam car, on the way down there, and we'll get into that day now, I mean, you're seeing this devastation before you. It's it's obviously quite, for, even if you have a mountain ton of experience, at that point you've been on the job 15 years, you've been in emergency for five years, four or five years. Even for you, it's shocking, let alone for somebody who's newer to the unit or newer to the job. So I guess when you're in the Adam car, we'll get into that first. On the way down, and you're looking at this, what's the conversation in the REP? Okay. Um, well, I was I just got done putting uh, the Scooby gear back in service onto the Adam car. Uh, that was my set of gear that I had up in three truck. I was in control of all the Scooby gear. 
So we had a brand new set of gear that came in, put it on the car. And that's when the call came in that a plane had just hit the trade center. We didn't know it was a large commercial jet. I thought it was like maybe a helicopter, a Cessna, something like that. I had no clue. So they said, let's let's start taking a ride down there. So the guy I was breaking in, Mike, he was he just got in the month before. He was in in August. He came to us. And he didn't have a lot of time there, just a few weeks. So we got in the Adam car. We said, yeah, Adam 3, we're going to start responding down to uh, World Trade Center. And um, it, it was kind of tough to do a size up because nobody had a clue of what was going on for the most part. You know, it was during the commuter time, 8 o'clock, we're on the Bruckna. I'm screaming down, lights and sirens. I'm trying to look down, and you could barely see a little bit of smoke because we were in the Bronx. Um, so you saw a little bit, not too much. You know, we hit the Triborough Bridge. I go, Mike, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the mobilization point. We grab as much gear as we can, and we're going to be, you know, split up into teams, and off we go. So as I was heading across Harlem, 125th Street, I kept looking down all the cross streets to look down. And I saw the smoke, and it was, I thought it was not funny, but people were just, like, walking around Harlem. And I was like, man, these guys are not even aware of what's going on down there. I had 1010 winds on. I'm trying to maintain the radio. Um, I'm trying to listen to citywide radio to try to get some intel, see what was going on. A lot of people were uh, getting loud, screaming. Um, and I was, like, trying to listen up. And a lot of the trucks from all over the city said, hey, we're going, we're going. So I'm like, all right, there's going to be a, a lot of, you know, manpower down there. So we started heading down the West side highway. I can get a better view. You know, I saw the smoke, you know, and I'm like, going, wow, this is something else. We are, you know, coming into a big job here. And it's kind of tough because, you know, even in STS, they really didn't prepare you for a major plane crash like this into a tall building. You know, this is before even the second plane had struck. So, you know, we pull up on the scene and we start to tack up. We have our uh, air packs on. We've got our rope rescue gear on, you know, the harnesses. I'm checking Mike because he hasn't been there for a long time. I want to make sure that all his stuff is in place properly. You know, um, we're grabbing extra bottles, forcible entry tools, first aid here. Because, like I said to you before, we're not there to fight the fires, but we're there to force doors. We had to help the people escape and get out. So Kenny Winkler's the guy that's organizing the teams and he's sending different guys, you know, for, I think it was a Sergeant with four or five cops and they would go into each tower. It's different stairwells. Cause for those of you that may not recall the makeup of the world trade center, it's not just one big stairwell. It's such a big complex that there were multiple stairwells in the same tower. So you'd have stairwell A, a B, stairwell B, stairwell C, and different, different guys, different teams would attack each stairwell to, you know, as you just said, assist with the evacuation. So I, I know you're eventually with Lieutenant John Murphy, but as far as the team that Kenny put you with, what was that team? Uh, the team was made up um, of guys from four truck and three with me and Mike. And uh, Murph was from the South, but he had come up that day. Um, and we saw Kenny. Kenny just got off of work. He was a midnight guy. He was from one truck. And uh, he was in a, a t an ESU T-shirt and shorts. And I believe he was wearing a red helmet, a red uh, rope climbing helmet. Yeah. And those guys come over here to this mobilization point. Uh, this is where we're putting you guys into teams. And by the time we'd already got tacked up and we started making our way over there, the second plane had struck. And we knew we were under attack at that point in time. Uh, so the North Tower was struck, and it was on fire. So we headed over to Kenny, and he goes, okay, where's your boss? I'm like, we have no boss. It's Adam 3, um, Adam 4, and I think Boy 4. We were all together. It was uh, four truck guys and three. I was comfortable working with them. You know, we flew uh, back and forth many times, either three truck, four truck, and I knew all the guys that were there. I trusted them in my life. You know, and once uh, Lieutenant Murphy came on the scene, Kenny put us into a team. We were team number five. Um, and then he goes, yeah, you guys, I've got two teams in the South Tower, two teams in the North Tower. Take a tower that you want to go and just, you know, go in there and do good. And that's when we started heading in. Um, you know, my my then girlfriend, now my wife, she had worked for Morgan Stanley and she was just moved from the South Tower Lost Dave there for a second. We'll get Dave back. Um, but this has been a riveting chat so far. We're now we're into it. And I and team five. Well, okay, got him back. 
Here you go. Here you You're back. Mike, you're back. Actually, Mike. I think it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. I don't know. But you left off. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. So we left off, and um, Murph goes to us, hey, where do you guys want to go? North Tower or the South Tower? And had I made that decision, I would have said, hey, let's go to the South Tower to look for my girlfriend. We would have been, you know, ultimately lost because the South Tower, as everybody knows, is the one that fell first. But we wound up going to the North Tower because, A, we had a lot of heavy equipment with us, and, B, it was a lot closer. We had to dodge a lot of the bodies that were jumping, a lot of the people that were jumping down. We said, this one's a lot closer. We don't have to go through the uh, concourse. Why don't we just go to the North Tower? And that's what our target was. We were starting to head to the North Tower. I think the team was, and I think I'm going to show a video of what I believe is you guys in a moment, now that it comes back to me. Tenant Murphy, you, as you just said, Mike Garcia, Evan Schwerner, and Rich yep. Hardigan. Evan, Rich Schwerner, um, uh, Bobby. Wait for Dave to come back. We'll be back momentarily. Um, Steve Linos. <laughs> yeah, Steve Linos. He went to the bomb squad. Yeah, Steve and eventually went out there. We were a pretty big team. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I believe this is you guys. Tell me if it is. These are firemen first, but it's going to segue into, I believe, Team 5. I'm going to put on my glasses just so I could see. Uh, yeah, that was that was us going in. Okay. That's me, but that's me right there. And then Mike Garcia, the uh, little fella next to me on the left-hand side. Wow. Yep. We were wow. going through. That was probably, if something would have happened to us, that would have been the last uh, pictures of video of us that you ever saw. Yeah, yeah. We were, and, and we didn't know what we, you know, the hell we were heading into. At that point in time, um, they don't prepare you for 210-story buildings with uh, two commercial jet airliners crashed into it. It's like, okay, get all the people out. Good luck. You one, know? Wow. one thing I, I need to ask about is that, you know, I feel like people gloss over this, is that it's an amazing physical feat, even if you're in great shape, to get up those stairs, which are understandably crowded with people coming down, with all that equipment on, that Scott pack is heavy. All that rescue stuff you're carrying is heavy, you know. So getting up there physically, what was the key to making sure you didn't gas yourself out? You know, when I, I started looking up there, I was looking up going, the elevators are out of service. I said, God, we're going to have to walk up 80 flights of stairs carrying all this equipment. And you're right. It was very, very tough because those are 45-minute bottles we were wearing. They're heavy along with all the equipment that we were carrying. We had extra extra bottles. We had extra rope. We had four supply tree tools. Our hands were full. We were loaded down like pack mules. And just to get on gas, it's very, very tough. Because you got to figure, walking up 80 flights of stairs, just in your civilian clothes and sneakers is tough. You're in a uniform. You have your helmet on, boots, everything else going up there. I couldn't imagine doing it. And we actually never, ever made it to the North Tower because... By the time we were getting ready to enter the North Tower, that's when the South Tower had fallen down, mm. almost on us. You know, we were under the underhang of uh, Building 5, which is uh, right there. And that's where we kind of rode out the uh, North, I'm sorry, the uh, South Tower coming down, collapsing on us. So you were, you were handling the evacuation of adjacent buildings or underneath where the PATH train was? No, we were already upstairs on the concourse. We were looking okay. to make entry into the North Tower, and that's where right. the South Tower uh, started rumbling, and I heard three explosions, and that's when it started coming down on us. Yeah, yeah. So I guess afterwards, on the plaza, there's a moment where the guys from the bomb squad pull up, and you're there. And I believe, well, the guys that were on the, the plaza, if my memory serves me correct, Evan Schwarner, you, Rich Hardigan, Mike Garcia, Lieutenant Murphy, uh, Joe Dolan, who had just moved over to the bomb squad after 10 years in emergency a few months prior, uh, I think John DeLara, Billy Beery, Mark DeMarco, Mike Curtin are there too. Dan McNally's there, Steve Burbridge, Michael Mixon, and Claude Richards. And it's at that moment when all you guys have converged here and you're discussing, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we have to try to get done. That Lieutenant Murphy's on the radio as uh, we wait for Dave we're to come back. back here. Okay, he's back. Uh, I was saying that we're, you know, you're waiting for, uh, you're with these guys, I should say, and uh, Lieutenant Murphy's on the radio. And that's when he suffers a particularly frightening injury. Uh, yeah, he was. He was on the radio saying that we had a lot of people that needed to be evacuated and we needed more ambulances or buses to respond down to the Trade Center. Uh, it was at that point in time when he was talking on his radio, a piece of debris had fallen down and almost severed his hand off. He dropped the radio and he was bleeding quite profusely. Uh, Steve Linos was there and there's a picture of them uh, that's on the plaza 
Uh, his Lieutenant Murphy's arm is all wrapped up. It looks like he's got a baseball mitt, and Steve is holding his hand up uh, because they were trying to stop the bleeding. They had, uh, you know, elevation to try to stop the bleeding on him. Um, that was, you know, one of the ones we lost him and Steve at that time. They started evacuating and heading down to the ambulances that were waiting. Um, and then we were down to the last six of us, you know, before the North Tower had fallen. Right. So I know afterwards, and I'll try to find that photo momentarily because I do know what you're referring to here if I can get it. But afterwards, there is a split where, you know, of course, you go with Team 5 and the guys that I mentioned previously, Bury, DeMarco, Kurt, and Delera, and the guys in the bomb squad, McNally, Burp, Rachel, Mixon, and Richards go into Building 6, and, and that's where they were when the other collapse happened. Where was Team 5? Uh, team five, we were outside the customs house. We rode out the first um, one there, and the second one, we were by building four. They were the small buildings that um, were in the front of the Trade Center. Um, if anybody's been down to the uh, World Trade Center uh, Memorial now, they've got the survivor staircase that's there. They were able to excavate it, and that's where we kind of rode it out. We were up by the nursery. Uh, they had a nursery for the kids of the workers that worked at the trade center. And that's where we wrote out the, uh, the second, the North tower collapse, which was worse for me and the other guys than the South one, because we were a lot closer to the, uh, smoke and the debris that was coming down. Um, if you have ever seen it on the news channels, like CNN or something, when you see all the cops and firemen running away from the cloud of smoke, we were at the base of that smoke. We had nowhere to go. We had nothing to breathe. Although we had the sky packs on. I don't want to take my helmet off because I was afraid I was going to get hit in the head with something. So, oh uh, yeah, that's the uh, picture with Lieutenant Murphy. He's got his hand up. Uh, looks like a baseball mitt. And that's Steve next to him trying to hold some elevation just to stop the bleeding. Uh, Murph was taken to the hospital and he had his hand uh, reattached. And thank God he can still use it to this day. It wasn't fully off, but it was pretty severed. It was pretty messed up. And we lost him. He was out of the game for the rest of the day. So, um, we had our own leadership, but we really looked at Bobby Steinman, um, who was a senior E-man on Team 5, uh, to try to get us out of there. And, hey, Bob, what do you think about this? You know, and he's like, let's go here. Let's go there to get out. Um, so we wrote it out uh, by Building 4. That's when the South Tower came down. And the, the stuff that came out uh, between the, the cloud of smoke and the dust and everything, the debris, it was like kind of like um, the equivalent of having somebody put flour or Bisquick in your mouth. And to try to take it out, I thought I was going to drown in all that stuff that, that day um, from the second collapse, even though I did have the Scott pack on. When I finally when I finally heard the rumbling stop, I took my helmet off and I did breathe in. Unfortunately, I didn't purge my mask and had a lot of debris in air. And I sucked in air because I couldn't breathe any further. I thought I was going to drown, you know, with all this uh, stuff that was in the air. And when I did, I breathed in all the debris into my lungs, and I was coughing like crazy. And unfortunately, now I've got 12 granulomas on my lungs. Um, before I came into emergency, they gave us all baseline OSHA physicals uh, just to see if there's anything wrong with us when we get out or, you know, proceeding on with your career. And they said, yeah, we took a look at your baseline. You didn't have these before September 11th. And I go, yeah, I do now. And I had to go for uh, a lot of MRIs and just to make sure that was okay. But they were still, uh, you know, on my lungs, and they're still there today. They're not growing, thank God, but still the calcifications, you know. Yeah, I, I'll I'll hit on a few more things here, and uh, before we wrap up tonight, it's been a great show with you. Is I know after that happened, for those of you that don't know, there was a plaza to the trade center. You, it was ground level. You'd have to go up a set of escalators to get up to the plaza, which is where you guys had been. Mark, Dan McNally, Mark DeMarco, Bill Bury. And a couple of Port Authority ESU officers were stuck up there and they needed to get down. You couldn't do anything for Claude Richards, John DeLair, and, and Mike Curtin. They were killed in that collapse. But the other guys were stuck uh, and they were trying to get out. So I know eventually they did get down using a ladder. Were you on the – it was Team 5 the guys that helped them get out? No, we didn't. Um, okay. After we had gotten out uh, from the second collapse, we had you know, rescued probably two to 300 people off of the plaza, setting them down the Survivor Staircase, hence the name Survivor Staircase. We weren't involved in the uh, DeMarco rescue at all because they were in a different part of the plaza. We were blocked off by flame and debris from the North Tower. We weren't by them, unfortunately. Otherwise, we would have helped them. But we were trying to get the civilians out. Once we left because the fire was chasing us out of the uh, plaza, 
um, due to debris and the fire that was coming down, we immediately we evacuated out of the plaza also. And that's when we went off uh, looking for our command, but we couldn't find anything out there. So you look back at, at this and, and uh, obviously, you know, a lot of good guys were, were lost and, you know, of the 23 that died, 15 were from the Special Operations Division, if you include Danny from the bomb squad. But at 14 of them were ESU cops and three of them, you, I mean, you knew all of them, but obviously three of them you worked with directly um, in truck three. And that was Vinny, who I said earlier was in two truck that day filling in. And then obviously Jerome Dominguez and Wally Weaver. When you look back on these guys, just to focus on how they lived, What's your fondest memory of either of those guys? Oh God, just the uh, dedication of the both of them. Wally, Wally's dedication, um, also Jerome's dedication uh, for rescuing people. Some of the laughs that we had, we used to, you know, hang out, uh, do things off duty. Um, we we carpooled each day from Queens to uh, over to uh, three truck because we were so cheap. Uh, the city didn't pay us, so we had to uh, save money on the Easy Pass. So. One day will be Wally's turn to drive. Another day will be Jerome's or mine. And uh, we got along so great. We used to hang out. And it was a very, very tough loss. We lost a lot of uh, experienced guys. We lost a lot of knowledge that day. You know, yeah. I, I'll never forget them. As a matter of fact, on my arm, I've got the uh, you know, Trade Center tattoo with their initials on. <coughs> WWE. Joel Wait for, for Dave to pop back in here. He gets, he gets frozen on the on the funniest faces. I don't want to embarrass the poor guy, but leaving him there with the face looking like that. Okay, here he is again. Sorry I'm about back. that. I'm He's back. returned. You had your tattoo? Yes, I got the tattoo. And also, uh, Vinny Dance. Remember him. Love him, too. You know, it, it just a lot. You know, it was very, very tough. But, yeah, we uh, will honor them every day. Not only 9-11. Uh, before I get to, you know, you leaving and, and 12, um, when the ranks were filling up, I mean, uh, you can never, ever, ever replace these guys, obviously. And they have never been replaced in the 20 years that they've been gone, almost 21. But as far as refilling the ranks, you have people who are coming in, and they're kind of coming in under circumstances. They, I mean, they wanted to get in, but they didn't want it this way. I'm sure they would have rather got in under normal circumstances. But you have to break them in because, okay, we were, we're down a lot of these guys. We've lost so many uh, personnel. We've lost a lot of experience, as you said. As far as the process to break in these new guys and gals, while you're still mentally processing what just happened to you, how difficult was that? And do you find that training these guys and gals, in a sense, was almost therapeutic? Yeah, it was to a certain extent. Now, the class, they had an SCS class in when uh, the Trade Center had taken place. Unfortunately, right after the Trade Center, they took them out and they were only halfway trained. Mm. Um, so we had to break them in. Um, and they've never seen anything like this or done anything like this before with certain things. I'm like, going, hey, did you guys go over animal control? I'm like, uh, no. It's like, all right, great. Let's go over animal control. Let's go over air jacking bags. Let's go over um, some of the things that you didn't do. They were still sending us down to the Trade Center because don't forget we were there till May of 02. We were still uh, searching for, you know, the missing down there. Of course, it was just a recovery mission by that time, but we still had the guys that were breaking in. They figured, well, we're going to put them on the midnights to backfill um, just so they can learn a little bit, too, because they were basically went right from patrol. Uh, they learned a little bit about ESU, and then, boom, they were in ESU. Uh, some of them had been to the range. They didn't know what tactics. They didn't know about, uh, about emotionally disturbed people. Uh, so we kind of had to teach them on the fly. Um, and you're right, it was therapeutic because you talk about the guys that we lost and the guys uh, that they specialized in different phases of emergency service. Like Jerome, he was a strong scuba guy. He was like a master diver. Uh, Wally knew everything there was to know about animal control. He was a uh, New York State licensed trapper. So we tried to teach them a little bit of what they what they had, and it, and it was very, very helpful. You know, but uh, the guys, they had to really come around quick, you know, to get them up to speed to be E-men. As I always like to ask for anybody that was FDNY or NYPD on the show, and before we get to the concluding segment, I guess this is what this is what I'll ask you about. There's always that moment that says, you know, the light bulb goes off above your head and you know, yeah, I should probably exit stage left. By that point, you'd had 25, 26 years on the job. Like I mentioned when I was introducing you, close to 27. Right. When was that moment that you said, you know what? Yeah, and I'm, and let, me, let me put in my papers. Well, you know something? Um it's a young man's job, number one, especially emergency service. I was getting up there, not only in age, but uh, retrospect of what I was doing. 
I was assigned to Floyd Bennett Field because I needed the uh, the hours, um, and I was down there working. One of the first things was a lot of the guys that I had broken in or came in after me were retiring. Uh, I'd look in the personnel orders, uh, guys I used to work with in the 705, they were all gone. All the guys in emergency service that I were breaking in, they were starting to go. I'm like, what am I doing here? Because, you know, you carry a lot of heavy equipment, especially going to like subway jobs or even another World Trade Center job. And, uh, you know, the Bell Parkway was uh, really kicking my butt. You know, you've been here for two hours coming home. And I'm like, what am I doing? So my wife said, hey, you know something? Maybe you better think about, you know, retiring. And I said, yeah, maybe my time is coming down. So I went down there. I looked at my retirement numbers. I said, what am I doing? I said, let me give it a shot and we'll see how it uh, how it is. And I retired. I look back and as they say, you miss the clowns, but you don't miss the circus. You know, you miss the guys. You love the guys, but you don't miss the nonsense. And uh, I haven't looked back at all. You know, uh, sometimes I, I still dream I'm on the job. I miss the big jobs that they get, like when they had the Metro North train uh, derail. And I was like, oh, how is that job? You know, you miss the big jobs like that. But um, like I said, you know when it's time to go. Everybody knows when it's time to pull the pin. You know, it's pulling the pin out of the shield and retiring. And it's time to let the new kids uh, come up behind you. And that's exactly what they are. Like, I'll go up there now to uh, the 4-3 for 9-11 services. And I see the patrol cops up in the 4-3. And I'm like, my God, they're babies. But they're not babies because I looked like that, too, when I got on a job when I was 21 and 22 years old. And now, you know, looking back on it, you know, I'm the old timer now, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I did it. It's, you know, I'm, I'm approaching 10 years retired now. And uh, I don't miss it at all. But I think, obviously, you know, the key, as with anything in life, is to leave something better than you found it. And I think that you can look back, as we've talked about tonight with your career, fondly, especially on those emergency service years. I mean, did I change the world? No. Realistically, you know, that's not going to happen. But leaving it better than you found it, I did the best uh, that I could. And I think that kind of pride uh, definitely has to, you, you definitely feel that a dec almost a decade away from the job. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, they come on the job wanting to make a difference. You know, as a cop, hey, I want to make a difference. When I went to emergency service, you know, after a while, I was in charge of breaking in a lot of guys. And I actually broke in 12 to 13 guys in truck three. And hopefully something that I taught one of them lives on in somebody else that they broke in because it has been 10 years. That's half a career, you know. Mm -hmm. So hopefully something they said, oh, this guy, Dave Brink, taught me this or Dave Brink taught me that. Well, this is the way he used to do it. And hopefully, you know, it, it ciphers down to one of the new guys. And through that way, I still live on the job or the guys that taught me that because, you know, the guys that broke me in, I just passed down the knowledge, passing the torch, you know. So hopefully I pass down the torch to the uh, new guys and they carry on the traditions of emergency service of the guys that came before us and the guys that, you know, were <clears> after us, you know, and uh, just it's the, it's the best unit in the department. I know I'm biased, but that's a God's honest truth. I'm sorry, uh, everybody else, bomb squad or other commands. The issue is still number one, and it always will be, and I don't care what they say. But uh, that was the best job of my life. I loved it. I always look back on it. And, you know, we uh, we help more people than we hurt. That's all I got to say. You know? Before before I get to the concluding segment, there you go. Emergency service. <laughs> Retired. Baby. I love it. I love it. Uh, you're be, you'll be in for a nice surprise here. You know who says hello, Chief Animo? Oh, well, that, that's great. You know, uh, the chief, he was a legend absolutely on that job. And we all looked up to that guy, and he was something else. You see him pull up on a job, and you would have to like, oh, chief's on a job. We better be on our game, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's fantastic. I, I do appreciate it. Uh, oh. Technology strikes again. We'll wait for Dave to come back. He'll be back. Hey, chief. There he is. He's oh, back. I'm back. Come on, Mike. We got to get a better system here. <laughs> I know. Breaking in and out. I know. I got to get my money up. Yeah, exactly. Well, but as you were saying, patients come your way to get it. <laughs> you know, but it's great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I, Chief Animal, I've had him on the show a few times now. Great guy. And, well, Chief, you got to come up and see me. You know, you got to come up to New Haven. I, we don't bite up here in New Haven. I'll take you for a slice at the finest pizza around. Uh -huh, if you ever do you come go. up here. There you go. That's Pepe's nice Pizza. Place. You know, Mike, to go up there and get some pizza with you, you know? Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. I'm down. I am down. I, I, you will be in for a treat, my friend. So in that vein, we go now to the conclude, concluding, there we go, segment of this show called Rapid Fire. Five pit run questions for me, five answers from you. Are you ready? 
Um, no, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and you can say pass. You can say pass if you want. Now, I know you mentioned at the top that, you know, a lot of your friends were going into the financial sector when you were thinking about what you wanted to do with your life. So besides that, you can't say that as an answer. If not for the police department, what other career could you have seen yourself pursuing and enjoying? Um, possibly the fire department. Like I said before, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be a firefighter. I was a cop. Um, I was always a service minded or, uh, oriented person. And uh, so I could see firemen. I know a lot of guys in the issue are probably shaking their heads going, Dave, what the hell are you talking about? But that's a God's honest truth, you know, because uh, I couldn't see myself behind the desk doing a nine to five uh, in the financial field like the rest of my friends were doing at the time. They were making good money back then in the 80s, you know. But uh, no, that's not me. So definitely a service oriented uh, job to help yeah. people. Some people are about Wall Street. Others are not. Hey, you know, teach that their was, own. No, me. that was not you. Second most uplifting call you ever responded to. Um, labor in progress, uplifting job. Absolutely. How can you not have that? Um, I was there to guide this new little life uh, into the earth, and that was fantastic. You know, with so much death and destruction, it always happens when the issue or other cops are getting called to. This woman was giving birth. Um she was by herself, and we got there before EMS, and be, um, and it was her second or third child. I have to get my system up. I got to fix my system. I'm hit, folks. You got a Taru's got to send me some money. You know, I can remember. Get... I can remember like exactly. I can remember it like it was yesterday. But that was probably one of the most uplifting job that I was uh, on. It was your second and third child. You were second or third child. You were saying? Yeah, heard. I've I've delivered five kids. Um, some out here with the volunteers, uh, but three in the city, one was in the seven, five and two was in emergency. That was great. Great stuff. Third, besides the Bronx, favorite borough to work in Brooklyn in the house. Uh, I started my career in Brooklyn. I ended it in Brooklyn. Uh, my family's from Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn. Bronx was, uh, the boogie down has been in my home, but, uh, Brooklyn will always be in my home. There you go. Fourth favorite bar or restaurant in New York city. Uh, that's easy. McSorley's in Manhattan for beer. Yeah. Gotta love McSorley's. Uh, I mean, there's a million and one different <clears throat> bars, restaurants in there, but definitely McSorley's uh, for a good beer over there on East 7th. And uh, as far as restaurants go, one place I used to love to go with my dad, uh, Brennan Cause for hot roast beef in Brooklyn. If you haven't been there, you should go try it. I'm not doing a commercial form, but uh, I still love it to this day. Their roast beef sandwiches are the best. Oh, my gosh. And there you go. You thought I was going to say four seasons, right? But hey, listen, I'm just a retired cop. <laughs> if they're listening, sp sponsor the show. You know, listen, yeah, exactly. get in touch with me. My yeah. contact information is in the description. Find me. I I have no problem. You know, I, I, could, I could use the coin. I need to upgrade my suit game as well in addition to my technology. Go, <laughs> Fantastic. Let me tell you. Thank you very much. Fifth and finally, you know, when you see these big graduations over at the garden, if you could grab one of these new cops that just came on and they're so full of vigor and life and they're excited and you can give some give them some advice, what would you tell them? Well, I tell them, do the best job you can uh, for the people in the city. You know, never, ever forget the reason why you came on this job. Do not become jaded. Um, just do the best you can, you know, and that's right. it. You're going to wind up saving a bunch of lives out there and uh just do the best that's all there you go don't sign off yet we'll say goodbye off the and air but before uh, yes it, as, absolutely so uh before we before we say goodbye to the audience and like i said we'll say goodbye off the air so stick around any shout outs to anyone or anything that you want to give no i just like to say uh to <clears> the <throat> out there listening i hope i did as well you know uh come on my show it's fantastic you'll get to talk about all great experiences to the rest of the uh, civilians listening in i hopefully this lets you into a little bit of our world on what we do as emergency service guys. Now, let me tell you, Mike only scratched the surface. I can't believe it's been an hour and 20 minutes already. I know I go on and talk and talk and talk, but there's so many different jobs I could have told you guys about, uh, the funny jobs, the sad jobs, but that's we're going to save that for another day. But, Absolutely. Uh, yes. Absolutely, and you're welcome back on the show anytime. And I saw Alicia be in the chat put, is the 7-5 still active today? Alicia, I'm sorry, I missed that question. Yeah, it is still a pretty active command these days. Yeah, They've one thing about around you, they're still busy. As a matter of fact, they're putting the uh, anti-gun unit in there, the 7-5, yeah. 7 Some commands just can't be rehabilitated, you know, and they've mm -hmm. always been busy and they always will be. You there know, you but a uh, big shout-out to the 7-5, love it. That's where I lost my youth, and uh, I just love it there. 
my shout out as always to all the e-men. You got my contact information in the description of this video on YouTube. If you ever want to be on the show, call me up. I'd be happy to have you. And let's go in order and shout out the audience. Once again, Ruth Ann Griffin, Bill Ryan, retired NYPD, first grade arson explosion squad detective, John Lutanzio uh, from Three Truck as well. He retired out of ESU and he'll be on the show soon. The Truth, uh, Michalina Serino, Alicia B, I'll mention you again if I mentioned you already, just to make sure I don't miss you. Joe Conway, Chief Louis Anamone, Peter Pranzo, Raquel Pranzo, Bob Geis, and let me see, make sure I don't miss anybody else. Margaret Hearn, uh, if I mentioned you again, I'll mention, you know, that's fine. Uh, twice. So nice when you say it twice, just to make sure I cover all the bases. So coming up next in the Mike and Maven podcast, we shift over from the E-Men over to HNT for volume two of the new miniseries, the newest miniseries that we have on the show. Talk to me, life on the NYPD's hostage negotiation team with retired NYPD detective Christian Flood. In the meantime, on behalf of retired NYPD officer Dave Brink, this has been volume nine of the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. I'm Mike Cologne. We will see you next time. And as the E-Cops like to say, anytime, baby. Take care. See you later. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.